Hey comic fans, Scott Harris King here, and I'm back with a special treat, I guess. I threatened to do this when I showed this off. I got this in a 50 cent bin a couple weeks ago, and I thought it might be fun to go through it. Here it is. It's Wizard Magazine number three. So this goes right back to the beginning of Wizard Magazine and the beginning of the Speculator Age, sort of the end of the Copper Age, the beginning of the Modern Age. Cover dated November 1991. So this comes out here at a key moment, key turning point in the, in the history of comics in America. Because it's at this pivotal moment where the image founders are mostly still working at Marvel, but they're just about to leave. And so comics are riding a huge speculator boom. X-Men number one has just come out. X-Force number one has just come out. Spider-Man number one was the year earlier. And uh, there's just books selling by the millions, numbers never seen before, even in the golden age. Um, and so that leads to uh, the artists becoming the most important figures in comics. And that leads to just a year after this, those artists quitting Marvel moving to create their own company. This is taking place right as that's about to happen. So you can see here the cover. These early issues of Wizard, they all had the wizard sort of mascot, which was just a wizard in the classic, like, you know, purple robes and cone hat with the stars and moons and stuff. Um, and in this case, you can see Wolverine's just shredded that costume. Um, it's by Eric Larson. So there's an interview with Eric Larson here. So what's happening as we see, we'll see in here, is that Todd McFarlane has just left his new adjectiveless Spider-Man series that he had launched to such fanfare just a year and a half earlier. And Eric Larson is taking that book over. Eric Larson also has already taken over, had already taken over Amazing Spider-Man from McFarlane when McFarlane went to do adjectiveless Spider-Man. Um, and so that's happening. Rob Liefeld is still on X-Force. Jim Lee's X-Men has just launched. So Jim Lee is, um, it's at that place where he's basically just pushed Chris, Chris Claremont out um, after Claremont, you know, basically made the X-Men what they were. Um, Marvel just unceremoniously fired him so that Jim Lee could do his own thing because that was the new power of the artists. Wills Portacio has just taken over the other X-Men series, although he didn't last very long on it. But all of those sort of founders, they're all, at this point where their their power is bigger than ever, but McFarlane's just left. I think this is where he's going to start working on Spawn, and he's starting to cook up image here at this time. So that's the context for Wizard Magazine number three. And so I'm just going to go through this real quick and show you some, some fun stuff. Um, there's an ad on the inside front cover for Now Comics. Um, and... Those were around at the time. They had, as you can see, a lot of licensed properties. Green Hornet. Um, they've got Married with Children, the real Ghostbusters. Um, they had a number of titles at this time. I want to say they did, like, Terminator. I'm not really sure. But um, they were fairly well known. Um, but uh, we got some some fun stuff here. So here's here's an advertisement, right? Take a look at the stuff here that they're hyping. They're hyping Robin 2. Um, last year's Hot the Hottest Mini, Robin 1. Will Part 2 be this year's? Robin 2, The Joker's Wild. We are selling issues 1 to 4 uh, of the Surefire Smash with all 10 hologram cover variations. Um, the, which is a hilarious blurb, but the next one's even crazier. You know speculation's gotten out of control because it's for Wonder Man number 1. It says, amid the mighty Marvel mutant hype, a hot new series, Wonder Man number one. Here's how they try and pitch you on spending your money to speculate on Wonder Man number one. It says, when a blockbuster number one like X-Force comes out, other number ones released in and around that month are usually tremendously under-ordered. I'm not sure that's true. 
When New Warriors number one came out amid the Spider-Man number one hype, it was underordered and prices soared to four times greater than Spidey number one. Wonder Man could be next. Order your copies and cases from Big Bob's today. I wonder how many people decided to order cases of Wonder Man number one. Wow. I made a couple really, really boneheaded speculation moves uh, at this time. I got kind of caught up in the hype for a year or so and blew some money that I shouldn't have. But I never came close to buying a case of Wonder Man number ones. Um, and then we've got a thing here saying, oh, they still have X-Men 1 and X-Force 1 in stock. Yeah, everybody does. Um, 30 years later, everybody still has them because they were 7 million copies. Finally getting the attention deserves Sandman Special Number 1. A special glow-in-the-dark cover highlights the special Sandman one-shot issue. And then there's Hot Second Prince, Ghost Rider 15 and Wolverine 41. So... I wouldn't really want any of these today. Like they're, they're, it's terrible. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a little thing about baseball cards. This is right when the baseball card market was crashing. It was, uh, like there was a huge glut just a couple of years, right around the time the, the image creator started getting big and the comic speculation started is when, Trading cards that also had just taken off and there are all these new printer publishers all of a sudden in like 1988, 89, like Score and like, you know, Bowman and all these new imprints and stuff. And it just flooded the market with stuff. Um, anyway, here's the interview with Eric Larson about uh, Spider-Man. He talks about his plans on Spider-Man. Um, Uh, with the Revenge of the Sinister Six storyline. It's just so much forgettable nonsense and just claptrap from that period. Um, but, just to give you some sort of context for the time period. Um, then we have a little thing about how to collect comics, which I guess is used as a new magazine. They're trying to, and it's clearly appealing to new reader, new comic collectors because older comic collectors, you know, I've been collecting comics for seven years when this started and I thought this magazine was trash and the stuff they were, they were hyping was garbage. Um, I had been reading the overstreet, um, not just the yearly price guide, but they had a, like a, I want to say a quarterly, um, price got like magazine that that they put out um and that had all these um didn't have any of this these interviews or any of this fluff stuff but at the beginning of every issue they had market reports so the different um people that own comic stores would write in and they'd be like here's what's selling here's what's not selling and even with those there were some sort of market manipulation happening in those where people were trying to hype books that they had but not nearly to the level of this nonsense here um, the prices in here were just completely made up. It was just nonsense. So um, I don't think there, I think there were very few sort of um, older collectors who bought into anything Wizard was saying, but there was a lot of new people coming into the hobby. The people that were buying a case of Wonder Man number ones were reading this and they're reading these articles about how to collect comics and being like, oh, okay, that all makes sense. Um, so here's a here's the interview with Simon Bisley, um, which has some cool. It's got some of his Doom Patrol covers, which are coming out at the time. He's got his stuff with Lobo. This is during the period where people didn't realize Lobo was supposed to be a parody. Um, here's a Batman Judge Dread two page spread. This is pretty cool art. I do like Simon Bisley's art. Um, he just doesn't ever work on any characters or titles that I like. Um. Okay, now here's something interesting. Again, November 91, and they're actually talking about something in here that is now currently, currently hot for collecting. And so 30 years ago, they were trying to hype this and nobody really caught on. And now, 30 years later, it's finally catching on. They have an article called Alternate, uh, Alternative Collections about other ways you can collect comics. 
And the big thing they talk about is collecting foreign editions. And that's something I've really only seen in the last four or five years really start to take off. Like, um, you know, I, I was in Europe for New Year's 2019. So New Year's Eve, last day of 2018 into 2019. And um, I was, I went to a bunch of comic stores when I was in Europe and got a bunch of foreign editions and they didn't really cost that much because I don't think anybody cared. I mean, there were definitely keys that I could have gotten there for 20 euros that now I see here in the U S and they're like $450 or something crazy like that. Um, but here's a whole article where they're talking about, um, again, some stuff with some foreign editions. Um, they do have some other, um, alternative ways to collect comics. Like here's the thing about the Whitman variants which were known at the time, but there weren't really a lot of people collecting them. Um, they have a thing here that was like, hey, instead of collecting all these hot artists, why don't you collect hot writers? That'll be really cheap. They're right, that never caught on. But they have a thing here where it's like, you could collect all the stuff Denny O'Neill's ever written. That would actually cost you a little bit of money because um, he's got a lot of Bronze Age DC keys. But this article is actually pretty interesting, in particular to me, the, the stuff with the foreign editions. Uh, we got some ads here. Um, okay, Wizard Comic Watch. Here's where they tell you what's going to be hot. And their number one pick for what's hot, what you should speculate on, here it is. It's X-Men 193. Now, the reason they're hyping this is because they're like, ooh, it's got the first first appearance of two, two new mutants. It's the first appearance of um, Warpath. Uh, and it's the first appearance, the first appearance of, um, Firestar. Now Firestar just sort of, be, you know, they mentioned New Warriors not, uh, earlier. New Warriors was like in their, still in their first year here, year and a half, and was a hot comic. And Firestar was one of the main characters. So they're like, oh, you should get that. But they also mentioned that it's not actually the character's first appearance because they had previously appeared in this issue of Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends. But they're like, well, that's not in continuity. So even though this is her first appearance, it doesn't count because it's not a real story, which doesn't actually make any sense. Um, so that one's a, a massive dud. Um, even at the time, uh, just no. Uh, and then they're also like, you should get Batman 436. It's the first appearance of Tim Drake. Um, he doesn't become Robin until 457, but he has, he, they set things up here um, in issue 436. And now that's, that's a one that makes a little more sense. The issue with this, it, for me, is the same as a lot of things at this time, which is this issue of Batman was one of the top selling comics of the year uh, because um, the movie had just come out. So it's 1989, June 89, it's cover dated the same month the, the Batman movie came out. So Batman was like at the top of the sales chart and there were more copies of this sold than like anything else. And so it was like the easiest comic to get from 1989 was this. So in terms of speculating, I mean, speculating on the thing that where that has the most copies and is the easiest to find doesn't make any sense to me. Um, okay, now they have the thing of how to grade comics. Of course, they're using a Hulk 181, the second appearance of Wolverine. Um, all right, and then they have their price guide. So here's the price guide. A couple quick prices for you. Um, let's see. Well, they have this. They like I looked at Albedo for Usagi Ojimbo, and um, yeah, that is completely wrong because it lists issue uh, Albedo one as the first appearance of Usagi Ojimbo, and then they list a second print of issue one, which they have at the same value. They have both both regular number one 
and second print number one listed as being $75 and the first appearance of Usagi Ojimbo. Um, of course, Usagi Ojimbo first appeared in issue two. There was no second print of issue two. So none of that is correct. Like, it's all just completely wrong. Um, let's see. So... Now, uh, you might be interested in what they have. So, obviously, McFarlane is the hottest thing going. Venom is super popular. The most recent issue of Spider-Man they have listed is uh, 353. And at this point, so that puts issue 300 less than four years ago because they had um, done some of the some of those uh, bi-weekly stories each summer. So, it was, but it was around four years. Um, and issue 300 is listed at $35. Now, $298, the first McFarlane is also $35. So, um, like, the the artist was as important as the character, which is not, not the case anymore. Two, I mean, $298 still has some, some value, but, um, you know, they have uh, Avengers number one listed at $1,500. Um... And they have things like where they note things like the first appearance of Kang, first Wonder Woman, Wonder Man, first Immortus, whatever. But they're all they're not worth it. They're all worth the same price. So issues six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the same price. Um, Batman four twenty three. They've got a picture of it here with the McFarlane cover again. McFarlane's super hot at the time, and um, that is listed at five dollars. So it is interesting to see their prices here. Um, I'm going to take a quick look at New Mutants because I, I see people online say that, oh, New Mutants 98 was, wasn't worth anything. Deadpool wasn't a big breakout hit at the time. And that even for like 10 to 15 years afterwards, New Mutants 98 wasn't worth anything. Um, and it didn't become valuable until much later. So let's see. New Mutants 98. First appearance of Deadpool, first appearance of Domino, $6.50. Um, I should note that this is basically the same price as the issues before it, which ha are also listed as $6 and $6.50 because they had an Extinction Agenda crossover in them. Um, clearly, the book that's worth valuable here is, is 81, which is the uh, 87, the first cable. It's listed at $41, more than the first appearance of... Um, Venom, you'll note. So anyway, those are just a few a few of the prices. Um, they also have some trading cards. Now, these are things that have never really been worth a lot, except the last five years or so, all of a sudden I'm seeing people grading their Marvel cards, and Marvel cards are suddenly worth something. Um, they have these priced, but like only as a full set. So there's a set called X-Force that they have listed as $15. There's a Todd McFarlane set number two they have listed at uh, $12. Um, and then they have individual prices for the trading cards. So that's interesting to me because I don't remember these being worth anything. Um, and the price of almost all of these is like 15 cents, 10 cents, 20 cents. The only thing that's, that, that, there's some holograms that are listed at like $8 each. The only other cards that are like a dollar or more are Venom and Wolverine. So I'm not really sure what the point of the price guide is. If nothing's worth anything, like why even have it? But whatever. Um, they have a section on toys. They were always really big into the action figures. I remember that. Um, Okay, and then they have some uh, preview of what's coming up. And this has some interesting stuff. Shipping for the month of October. Check it out. Herbinger number one. Now, that would have been a good thing to buy at the time. Um, let's see. What else, do we, what else do we have that's interesting coming out? So we've got Harbinger number one. Anything else from Valiant? Not really. Aquaman number one. Um, boy, I, I don't know what some of these things are. Uh, Barbie number 12, so that's great. Um, Alf number 48. 
actually listed here. That's a big book for absolutely ridiculous reasons. Um, anything else coming from... I'm trying to see if there's anything else listed from, like, Valiant. Uh, I don't see any, I'm try, don't see anything else. Um, Valiant. Oh, Magnus Robot Fighter number zero. Valiant. Um, this was a good month to be jumping in on Valiant stuff. And you get stuff like it, um, Caliber is, is printing stuff. Um, AC Comics, Femme Force 42. Um, there's a brief section of um, video games, and then they jump to the top 10 hot books. Okay, it's interesting this is in the back. So here they are here. I'll go through them real quick. Number 10, Silver Surfer 50. It's an Infinity Gauntlet tie-in. Number 9, Infinity Gauntlet number 1. So those are both still big. X-Factor 71. That was the first issue of the Peter David era. Um, that was like, they did a line wide. All the X-Men books and sort of revamped that month. 63 is the first Will's Portacio issue of X-Factor. Um, Silver Surfer 34. That's where the Thanos stuff that led to Infinity Gauntlet started. Um, number five is X-Men 248. Now that's the first Jim Lee issue and that was like really valuable for a while. And like, again, that, that sort of book isn't really considered much of a key anymore. This is like first artist on the title or whatever, but it was really big at the time because everything was about the artists. Uh, number four, X-Force number one. Um, they specifically mention the cable card, whereas, of course, these days the Deadpool card is the one to get. Um, number three is X-Men, I'm sorry, New Mutants 87. Uh, number two is X-Men 281. And then number one is X-Men number one E. Now that's the one, E is the version with the gatefold cover um, that was more expensive than the other one. So they had like the four regular covers and then they had the gatefold where they had the whole thing with all four covers. Um, yeah, I mean, so New Mutants 87 is clearly the one that's worth the most today out of those. X-Men 1, X-Men 281, not really worth that much. 248 is not worth nearly as much. Um... X-Force 1, not worth anything. X-Factor 63, 71, not worth anything. The Infinity Gauntlet books are still worth something. So that is interesting. That that actually has more to do with the recent, you know, with the movie from five years ago. But still interesting. Um, here's the sales list from the previous month. So it's a little snapshot of history. Um, let's see. The top 100 comic books for the month of September 1991. So the, that was um, the most recent before this came out. X-Men number 2, X-Force number 4, Spider-Man 16, X-Men 282, X-Factor 72, Infinity Gauntlet number 5, Spider-Man 353, Spider-Man 354, Ghost Rider 19, Wolverine 48, Fantastic Four, 358. First DC book is that, number 12. It's Armageddon, <laughs> the Alien Factor, number one. Then we've got Silver Surfer, Sandman Special, number one. Silver Surfer, 59. Predator, Cold War, number one. Is that the Predator with the red cover? Hmm. Anyway. Yeah, it's just, it's a brutal beating for DC on this list. It's just an absolute beatdown. Like, there's almost nothing on here. Legends of Batman, Legends of the Dark Knight, number 24 is at number 20. That's the first regular issue of anything from DC. And then Batman 471 is at number 29. So you really have to go down there. Um, here's their list of the hot books. To get for the month. Infinity Gauntlet number six. Here's the Sandman special number one again. Um, it's just, just a bunch of crap. There's so much crap. 
uh, from this period, like so much crap. Um, here's a letter column, merchandise. Um, there's and in the back they do have a, a section that's um, about comics history. So they talk about different times that characters have been sort of rebooted or had brand new directions. Um, and they're talking about how sometimes it goes right and a lot of times it goes terribly wrong. There's an interview with John Byrne um, who's saying he's returning to X-Men. I don't remember him returning to X-Men at this time period. Um, let me just quickly see what this is about. Oh, Byrne is writing X-Men. Jim Lee's plotting it and drawing it and Byrne is adding the words. And that's clearly he came back because after, you know, he has this stupid feud with Chris Claremont. And so the idea of Claremont getting fired so they could bring John Byrne back, I'm sure, greatly appealed to John Byrne's ego. The fact that I don't even remember that he ever wrote it tells you how well that went. Um, and then there's a the thing about the history of Wolverine in the back, which I don't give a flying crap about. I can't even believe some of the stuff. Sorry for the long pause, but I was reading some stuff that was making my mind explode out of the top of my head. Logan, the man behind the machine, is much more than an adamantium skeleton, a healing factor, and a set of claws. He is one of the most intensely developed characters in comics today. At the same time, he is laced with as much mystery as his skeleton is laced with indestructible metal. Such a complex individual is only the result of a decade and a half of intensive character... I wish I knew what Wolverine they were reading about because that's that guy sounds a lot more interesting than the actual Wolverine that was actually in the comics that I was actually reading at this time because that guy was a one-dimensional, boring-ass character. Two dimensions if you include the ninja nonsense that Frank Miller overlaid on top of the original character. But wow, that's all I can say is just wow. I know there's people that are big Wolverine fans, so I apologize to all of you. But only a real Wolverine fanboy could like write any of that with a straight face, and maybe and maybe he wasn't, because when you're a professional writer, sometimes you just write what they pay you to write. But uh, that's nonsense, and that's it. Wizard number three. Well, it was just as exciting as I thought it would be, which is to say, I'm glad that those days are over because most of those comics suck. But I will say it's really interesting to look through this and to see in particular the sales charts from those years, the books that they had listed as like the hot back issues. Um, again, there was some manipulation there. They were pushing some books. Um, and in retrospect, some of that stuff doesn't make any sense. Like why would the hottest book be one that has 7 million copies in circulation? Like... Why would that be like the hot book to speculate on or the hot book people are trying to get when anybody could get a whole case of Wonder Mans just as easily? So I don't know. Um, it's really interesting to read this as a historical document. Um, it is also sobering to think just how far sales have fallen since then. And for me personally, this is... We're reaping 30 years later what the seeds are being sown uh, with this period and even with Wizard itself. So I'm curious what you all think. Let me know what you think down below and I'll see you next time.